This is Just Asking Questions, a show for inquiring minds on reason. Are the boys okay? Just Asking Questions. I'm Zach Weissmuller, Senior Producer for Reason, joined by my loyal co-host, Reason Associate Editor and fellow boy parent, Liz Wolf. Hey, Liz. Hey, Zach. For much of history, parents have preferred boys perceived as the providers, the family legacy, the heirs to the throne, a dark, unintended consequence of China's 36-year-long one-child policy was a 120 boy to 100 girl birth ratio. But in 21st century America, the script seems to have been flipped. The New York Times has run headlines like Wanting Daughters, Getting Sons, and It's a Boy, and It's Okay to Be Disappointed. Boys are falling behind in school, are more likely to display behavioral problems, and more likely to be perpetrators and victims of violence. Shifting gender norms, changing conceptions of masculinity, and the pitched political battles around these questions have made boyhood and parenthood that much more complicated. Raising boys these days ain't easy. Today's guest knows this all too well. Ruth Whitman is the author of Boy Mom, Boyhood in the Age of Impossible Masculinity, and the mother of three young boys. The book is about her experience as a modern boy mom living in the hyper-progressive Bay Area, as well as what she learned studying the psychological and sociological research on boys and talking to boys and men across the country and the political spectrum about their experiences and, importantly to the theme of this book, their feelings. Ruth, thanks for coming on the show today. Thanks for having me. So before I pass this off to your fellow boy mom, Liz, who has a beautiful 20-month-old boy, I've got... Three, I've got a three-year-old girl and two boys, ages six and eight, six and eight, uh, and so I've had a front row seat as to how things can go differently between the genders. Um, <laughs> the, these conversations always do seem to get bogged down in that nature versus nurture debate, and your book seems to try to move past that a little bit. How have you come to think of the nature versus nurture question when analyzing boyhood, both as an author and as a boy mom? So, the, yeah, the nature nurture thing, I think we do tend to get stuck on it. It's this um, and I think that people tend to there's a whole kind of body of research into nature versus nurture. And it's quite some of the science is quite sketchy on it. I mean, there's lots mm-hmm. of studies that you can kind of co-op to really prove any point at all. And I think people have used this research to prove all kinds of different agendas, whether that's a feminist agenda to say that, you know, all of this is socialized and none of it is innate or, you know, a sort of more um, right wing traditional, um, traditional gender norms uh, agenda, which is like, you know, these things are fixed and boys will be boys. So we just have to kind of um, accept that. And they've been used to sort of, you know, people have co-opted it to, to, to do some quite sexist things with it as well. I approach this, um, I I feel like I've looked at this body of research in many different ways throughout my life. So as a boy mom, I kind of went into the whole experience with this conception of feminism that was gender is all socialized. The only reason boys behave badly or, you know, that they might be sort of destructive or or naughty is because we let them, you know, we let them get away with it. And that's kind of like this feminist shibboleth. So I went into the project of parenting thinking, you know, I will just do this differently. I will socialize my boys to be well behaved and calm and compliant and all of these things. And of course, I got completely blindsided and completely knocked down by my <laughs> kids. Complete. I have three boys. They're wild. They are. I mean, they're calming down a little bit now that they were older. But when they were little boys, I would be that mom in a restaurant with three kids running in three totally different directions and just being like, oh, God, you know. What do I do? And feeling a little bit as though I'd walked into my own ideological trap. You know, this idea that if boys only behave badly because we let them behave badly, then this all must be my fault, this scene that's unfolding in front of me. So I kind of, I think a couple of things. One is that I think in a way it doesn't really matter, like where there are differences. We know that there are differences on a group level and obviously they don't apply to every boy and they don't apply to every girl. But we do know that on a group level, boys um, tend to be more physically active. They're 
behavior tends to be what we consider to be like worse. Um, you know, that they are more externalizing and girls tend to be more inter- internalizing, more more compliant, more docile. And we don't exactly know why. And it probably is a very intricate mix of nature and nurture, of, you know, genetics, socialization, epigenetics, all the rest of it. But one of the things that really shocked me when I did dig into this research was actually, you know, the way that our conceptions of masculinity kind of interact with the nature piece. So the surprising thing was what I that I found in the research was not just that boys are, you know, more rambunctious or physical, but actually they're much more emotionally vulnerable than girls. This is quite a stark thing in the science that a baby boy's brain is born about a month to six weeks behind a baby girl's brain in development. So, and that's um, in the white brain, which is the kind of emotional center. So it's the part that deals with attachment, with emotional self-regulation, with forming relationships. And so because a boy's brain is more immature at birth, they're actually more vulnerable and fragile and so they sort of need extra nurture to get to the same place. A baby bird girl is born, on average, more resilient and more independent. And I think because we have this view of baby boys as being sturdy and tough and robust and angry, we kind of project those qualities onto them. And instead of giving them more nurture, we end up giving them less nurture. What does that imply about way strategies for parents of young boys if if you're right that there's these assumptions about the quote unquote boy brain that are yeah. just wrong. Yeah. How might that affect how you look at raising a young boy? So I think it becomes this kind of double whammy. So you've got a, a brain that's like immature, emotionally vulnerable, sensitive, needs all this extra support and nurturing. But at the same time, there's this research that shows that parents um, approach baby boys in a subtly different way. So they they perceive them as being sturdier and tougher. They handle them in a more, you know, more, more roughly. They tend to like roughhouse with them, jiggle with them, um, you know, sort of bounce them up and down a lot, but give them less of that kind of nurturing, caretaking touch. And they talk to boys less about emotions. This goes throughout childhood, you know, that you see that parents spend less time talking with boys about their feelings than they do with girls. They're less receptive to their emotional displays. So it becomes this kind of double double whammy they need more and they get a little less it's quite subtle but it's it's real and so over time this adds up to quite a different relationship with um empathy with nurture with emotionality with relational skills and i think so we do boys a disservice we we should be giving them you know we should be giving them more but the kind of boys will be boys logic means that we sort of tend to shrug our shoulders and give them less it sounds like uh Unfortunately, brain science is a little gender essentialist. Uh, it is, yeah. Are we, as we sort of move away from gender essentialism, especially in a lot of more liberal and progressive circles, are we missing out on understanding this? Yeah, I think this is really um, an interesting point because it is gender essentialist, but it's sort of the wrong type of gender essentialist, if that it's makes like sense. It's like we need to understand the differences, but our actual sort of like cultural ways of handling them are not so good, but it's like we need to understand the underlying differences in order to find better ways of nurturing boys. Yeah, I think almost in a way what I found was that the the brain science, you know, and again, I don't want to overstate it, but I think what we were finding was that the brain science was actually pulling against the cultural story. So actually the cultural story is like boys, you know, boys are tough, they're strong, that they need to be, you know, and that they're emotionally uncomplicated. You know, I hear a lot of this, like, boys are like dogs, all they need are to, like, run around outside, get exercise, you know, food, exercise, wear them out, that's all all they need. But actually, um, you know, what the brain science is showing us is really the kind of opposite thing, which is that they're vulnerable, they're emotionally sensitive and fragile, they're vulnerable to disruption. So we need to kind of tell the opposite cultural story than the one that we're telling and so yeah I think we get caught up in these sort of essentialist stories and especially when it comes to brain science you know we get very hung up on like who can read a map and who can read emotions and who can you know who's good at math and who's good at languages and you know but actually the main differences aren't really cognitive differences but um emotional and attachment differences 
Why do you think that, you know, I referenced those New York Times headlines that you mentioned in your book as well. It's a boy. It's okay to be disappointed. Uh, there's, of course, the famous future is female t-shirts yeah. uh, that are uh, ubiquitous, I'm sure, where you live in the Bay Area, especially. Yeah. Um, you know, what What do you think explains what seems to be a cultural shift towards a preference if, if all else being equal parents would have a slight preference for a girl over a boy, maybe. Yeah, I think it's a sort of combination of old stereotypes and stories and new ones. So I think that there's this idea, there's always been this sort of slugs and snails and puppy dog snails, you know, little boys. I don't know if that's a British, is that a British expression or do you have it here? Uh, maybe, but I am familiar with it. Okay. Isn't it from like uh, Sound of Music or something? Like, I don't know. But It sounds yeah, like I, it might be. Yeah. yeah. It should be to yeah. some. Maybe I should sing it. Anyway. But you know, this <laughs> idea that like girls are good and well behaved and easy and boys are like naughty and badly behaved. And, and you know, so I think there's that old stereotype. So it's sort of parents want um, a good child, you know, an easy child. And there's this sort of idea that a daughter will be your friend for your whole life. And, you know, a son's a son till he gets him a wife. That's another one of those cliches, um, you know. And so this idea that, you know, as a as a mother of boys, you've got this built-in kind of heartbreak when your son will leave you, whereas your, your, your daughter can be your best friend. So I think there's all these old stereotypes. And then I think now in the age of, like, Me Too and toxic masculinity and this whole, like, wider cultural and political conversation there's this sort of fear of men you know this idea that men are harmful that they're bad that they could end up doing something terrible and girls just feel kind of safer mm -hmm. what's how it like that, raising did, or go ahead zach well yeah i was just going to ask how much of that you personally experienced because I, I know from reading your book that you actually chose to have three boys because you did ibf for your last child um did you go through many of those emotions yeah I mean we didn't choose to have three boys in the sense of like we did gender selection so it's not quite like that but we had um leftover embryos from our second child so our first child was our first boy was conceived naturally then we had IVF didn't do gender selection or anything had a second boy and then we had uh, some embryos that were left over which we knew were male um and so <laughs> we didn't have the choice you know to have a girl versus a boy but we no knew that he was a boy and we chose to have a third child if that makes sense so who? yeah you consented and to having a third well you signed up for this. yeah i signed up for this for this <laughs> reality um, at one point they thought as a little aside they thought that it was it could be because there were actually two embryos and they said do you want us to 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 transfer both of them and they were both male and i was like i think four boys <laughs> i draw my line of four boys but but three maybe um you're but, throwing yeah. cold water on all of my hopes and dreams <laughs> you want four boys I would love to have four boys. I think it would be. I think. I mean, oh. I want. I want four kids, and I love boys. Yeah, I like raising a son. Yeah, fun. I mean, it's it's had many wonderful parts to it, and it's had many challenges. And you know, who knows? You never have the counterfactual, <laughs> so you don't have the control child. That you know, if you if I had three girls or <laughs> one girl, or you know, but but to answer your previous question, yeah, I mean, no. I got a pretty negative response you know when I yeah. sort of told people that we were pregnant or that I was pregnant with a third boy you know it wasn't like congratulations how wonderful it was like oh god you know it was as if I'd said you know we've all got the norovirus or something you know <laughs> people were like oh okay okay good good is this catching you know so um you know I think there was this sort of fear of boys and a lot of you know you've got your hands full but in a sort of like rather you than me sense you know, sure. I don't think people thought that this was like a great thing that we were embarking on. What is it like, though, raising these three boys in the Bay Area specifically? So what I find really interesting about that question, and I've thought about this a lot, obviously, is that you would think that in the Bay Area, there would be this very expansive model for what a boy can be. And that we do have like very expansive ideas about gender here in the Bay Area. And we're talking about, you know, um, like a, a whole new understanding of what gender is and, you know, um, you know, from, from when I was growing up, you know, so it's um, kids like share their pronouns very routinely, very accepting of trans kids, non-binary kids, different types of gender identity. But what's really interesting is that the category of cis boy, so kids that were male assigned at birth and continue to identify as boys, that gender category has been remarkably resistant to change, even here in the progressive Bay Area. So... Yeah. 
There are slight differences. I mean, I think I'm sure it's probably much easier to be gender, you know, to, to experiment with with gender here than it probably would be in some other parts of the country, but not as much as you would think. And I interviewed a lot of teenage boys and, um, you know, young college age boys who were from different parts of the country. And actually what was really surprising was the similarities in what they understood the expectations of manhood and boyhood to be more than the differences. Do you think it's harder to grow up a cis male in the Bay Area? than to grab a cis male in another part of the country? Or? Yeah, in a place like Utah. Oh. Interesting. I don't know. I don't want to say harder because I think that there are pressures, and this is something that I kept on bump- bumping up against all the way through the research in the book, which is that I think there are, in this kind of moment of the culture wars, I think that boys are dealing with two very different and both impossible sets of expectations that are going on at the <laughs> moment. Um, one which is broadly coming from the right um, and the sort of old conception of masculinity and one that's broadly coming from the more progressive movement. So I think on the one hand, all the old pressures and scripts of masculinity, which are like, be tough, be strong, don't show your emotions, man up, you know, uh, be quiet and just sort of take it and be a man. You know, those pressures, I think, are very much still in circulation for boys. So And those come with real harms. I think they keep boys shut off from their emotions. I think they keep them shut off from forming intimate connections. And those are still very real expectations. But now there's this whole other side of things, which is like coming more from the left, which is like, you've had your turn, you're privileged, time to be quiet and let somebody else have a turn and express their feelings, uh, you know, that, you know, your feelings, it's not your turn right now. You know, don't talk about how your experience or your feelings. Let somebody else have a turn. And so that's coming from a good place. And it's coming from a sense of, you know, justice and equality and challenging power structures. But I think the lived experience of that for many boys is that they're feeling that they're getting shut down from everywhere. So mm-hmm. I don't know if it's tougher to be more entrenched in this kind of community where you get more of that sort of language or more entrenched in a sort of uh, an old fashioned masculine community where you're getting more of the other type. But I think they're both harmful. One thing I've, I, I, I agree with that. One thing that I've also theorized about a little bit, I mean, I'm raising my, my son in New York City, um, is this idea that sometimes when you're in a place that is interested in experimenting with lots of different forms of gender expression, like a place like yep. the Bay Area or a place like many parts of New York, yep. um, there can sometimes be a little bit of this weirdness that that seeps in where if you are a cis female or a cis male uh, and you're somebody who feels very at home, very comfortable in your own skin, very comfortable with, um, you know, the gender you were born as and you want to stay that gender. And yet in many other ways, you feel like the stereotypes, like we really have to be bucking the stereotypes and we need to be giving people more freedom to express um, moving away from those stereotypes. Sometimes it kind of feels like I don't want to say like all the attention is on those with uh, they, them pronouns or who are identifying as non-binary, but it's almost like if you are one of the few people in your cohort identifying as just a good old fashioned cis male or a good old fashioned cis female, it's like sometimes people in those communities load a whole bunch of stereotypes on you that perhaps in an ideal world, you would really be able to kind of be be rid of. But I know it's not dynamic, at least in some Brooklyn parenting communities. I don't know whether it's the same in the Bay Area. Yeah, I think one thing that I've noticed is that, I mean, much as I love the whole new conversation about gender and people's ability to embrace new identities, I think it can sometimes end up being like that the category, it's like if you want to challenge gender norms as a cis male, you have to move into a different gender category. Like, yeah. It's like you, you have, have to identify vacate. differently. Exactly. Right. So, so, and I think there's something essentializing about it. It's like if you you know, at this most basic, basic level, but, you know, if you want to wear pink, if you want to um, experiment with beauty or, you know, then maybe you are actually a she her, maybe you are actually a girl, maybe you are, you are a different gender and there's no room, we're not expanding the category of cis male, we're like essentializing it and vacating it. So it's sort of, yeah. cis male becomes like the kind of vacated downtown area of a major city where it's just like, like nobody's what? there anymore. It's just like anyone <laughs> who wants to try something different. And so if you're still in that in that box, 
then you really are boxed in. And I think even more than for cis females, actually, in this moment. Like, I think, girls, we have this very sort of um, inspirational language that we use to talk about girls and women at the moment. And it's like, you can be anything. You can be a CEO. You can be a scientist. You can be a sports star. You can be all of these things. And we, we talk in this very inspirational way, whereas I think with boys, we've started to talk in this very essentializing and very limiting way. So it's like, boys will be boys. Boys are like dogs. Boys don't like reading. Boys don't like school. You know, boys, it's just this sort of idea that we're just kind of stuck with boys' limitations and we just kind of have to work around them. What would you say to uh, expectant parents who are feeling those sorts of feelings that you're, that are captured by those New York Times headlines, for instance, yeah. where it's like, you know, the Me Too, you know, they're just going to grow up to be like Me Too predators or there's all these problems that boys have. They're difficult to raise. They're rambunctious. And um, there, there's all these uh, troubling outcomes, which we're going to get into in a little bit. Um, what would your message be at, at, after having gone through writing this book to people <laughs> who are anxious about having boys? I mean, so my view is like if people have a gender disappointment or gender fears, you know, I think we should make space for that because I think some of these things are real. It's like mm -hmm. I hear this sort of almost like defensive overcompensation in the other direction. So people who have all boys are like, but boys are great and everything about it is great and everything you're saying is completely false. And, you know, and I think that that sort of the boy mom hashtag that you see online is also has that sort of like overcompensating right. tone to it sometimes. And it doesn't, it sort of has a, it has a false note to it to me. Um, yeah. I'd much prefer that people are able to explore any feelings and to have these things acknowledged. And I think that, you know, and that's a personal preference. I think that, you know, I can see an argument for just being like, well, this is great and everything about it is great. And let's just, you know, not talk about those things. And I see, and, you know, you can see why people go in that direction because people, you know, love their kids and they want to defend their children. They don't want people saying bad things. And I've had lots of complicated feelings about all this myself. Sometimes when people are like, oh, God, oh, boys, you know, they're speaking to a fear that's in me as well. So I don't want to be like, but everything's great. And I've never felt that for one second because obviously I have. And I think that most people, you know, all of us feel many complex things all the time. I would say that like the early years for me of raising boys were very hard. I adore my boys. They're amazing and they're such amazing and complex humans. But like the physical energy and rambunctiousness was extremely challenging for me. And, you know, maybe that's a temperamental thing. Maybe it's a gender thing, you know, um, it's the kind of boys I have, the kind of person that I am. You know, it was it was hard. Um, now that they're getting older, I yep. I'm having so much fun with them. I love the way they are. I love their humor. I love their, you know, I I enjoy the differences. I think I when they were younger, I found the differences quite alienating in some ways. Um, you know, and so I think we can hold all those feelings. You know, there's room for. There's room for complexity here. Yeah, it is I think that you I'm mentioned. It. Go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say that that it it resonates with me because, um, as I mentioned, I've got the younger girl and then two older boys, and the, pretty much everything you write in your book uh, has conformed with that in terms of the energy differences, the yeah. idea that you know she's been in some sense easier. Yeah. than they were um that doesn't mean you know that they're not great in their own way but it's like uh the sort of you know conversational even yeah. at like this young age the conversations are a little bit different i'll be yeah. like putting her to bed and her question for me is always um tell me about your day they've <laughs> never my boys have never asked me that um right. so there's you know, I can't, it's hard for me to think like I somehow uh, conditioned that into them uh, yeah. because of like gendered expectations. Um, but even but, if you did, yeah. I mean, yeah, I was going to say, possible. even if, yeah. even if, you know, in a way, I think we get, again, we get hung up on this thing. So even, you know, even if you absolutely did condition that into them and, you know, somehow this entire thing is socialized and none of it is innate. In a way, so what? Because the culture is real. You know, if you have a boy, you're operating within one set of cultural expectations, one system, 
one set of peer group norms, one, you know, and if you have a go, you're operating within another set. So you're always going to be in conversation with that cultural system, whether or not, however much of it is innate, however much of it is socialized, you know, and so in a way, it doesn't really matter which it is, you know, it's so I sort of feel like if I have only boys, I am dealing with boy culture, boy stereotypes, boy norms, boy expectations, what's missing in there, what's present. And so, you know, it's not so much about whether my individual boy is innately a certain way or not. You know, it's more about the cultural reality that you you are dealing with. It's, um, I have to be very deferential to Zach during this stream <laughs> since it's about tending to boys' emotions. So I have to make sure yeah. that I'm tending to his uh, as well. Um, no, but I mean, what you're saying about the nature nur- nurture difference and Zach, what you're saying about your kids. I mean, uh, so a few weeks ago, Zach came and visited New York, um, which was awesome. And we we all had brunch together, uh, me, my husband, my son, Zach and his wife. And during that brunch, I mean, I'm sure, you know, Zach's a little bit f- further removed from the toddler years at this point. Uh, I mean, my my little kid, who's almost two, was he taking knives and trying to stab the table as we're all <laughs> yeah. doing a brunch party. Yeah. And it's like, you know, no, no big deal, right? He just his body totally is normal once, to me at this point. His body is yeah. constantly in motion, but there is this yeah. challenge of being in like Nolita in Soho in the middle of Manhattan, where there's not really space to move the body, uh, yes. and trying to keep this wiggly, just like constantly, yeah, you know, effervescent, vibrating, pulsating force just like in a chair and stable, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, this is my life and has been for the last, <laughs> you know, decade and a half at this point or nearly. Um, yeah, and it's like I would look over, at, you know, we had this very like funny little controlled conditions experiment because our neighbors had three girls who were pretty much lined <laughs> up with our boys in age. And it was, you know, the difference was very extreme. I and mean, I don't know whether, you know, and absolutely these are just like six kids there are many you know and I always get people saying oh but my daughter is completely wild and rambunctious or my son is really calm and all of those things exist in this wide wide world but I think at a group level it is true and we know there's data on this that generally the likelihood of having a wiggly active rambunctious boy is higher than having a wiggly active rambunctious girl and you know how do these oh go ahead (laughs) <laughs> I think we're dealing with a, an extra lag, perhaps, in this stream. Um, Go ahead, Liz. I was just going to ask, in what ways does do these, you know, sometimes male attributes affect how boys fare in school? Um, you know, you this is something, some of the behavioral challenges uh, and the way schools deal with them, this is something you go into in pretty great detail in this book. What yeah. are the challenges that they're currently facing in school and then later in life with like sort of failure to launch syndrome? Yeah, so there there is um, a lot of data at the moment that shows that boys are what they call underachieving in school, which actually is a slightly misleading term because actually what's happened is like everybody's performance in school has improved over the years. So across genders, but um, boys has improved more slowly and girls has, has taken off more fast. So boys lag behind girls in school, but it's not necessarily that they're underachieving. Maybe girls are just like really taking off but there is a gap and it goes all the way through school from kindergarten through to um oh i'm looking I'm sorry, at your, the wrong slide one. i was and here uh, yeah i i can't read it because i don't have my glasses on but um here we go oh yes boys uh, are less likely to get it yeah yeah so boys um yeah they're less likely to enroll in college and when they get there they're more likely to drop out they do worse in pretty much every uh level of schooling every grade I know we're using this as a proxy for like academic success, but like is some of this because boys have this galaxy brain to take and are perhaps maybe being diverted into trade schools or more practical routes that do lead them to have meaningful work and decent pay, just not degrees? Yeah, so I think there is some of that, but I think also there is this like failure to launch syndrome, which is like boys are really not doing anything, you know, the needs, you know, not in education, employment or training. So boys who are just living at home with their parents they don't have a partner they don't they haven't gone to college they don't have a job you know and this is a growing phenomenon amongst young males Mm -hmm. and with young women you see these trends that they're embracing the tasks of adulthood Um, unemployment is falling with young women college (laughs) entrance is rising you know all of these trends that as parents you know you would probably want to see from your children girls are, are doing much better in these areas than than boys are and there are multiple 
reasons for this. I think it's a combination of many things. And I think it's become extremely politicized, you know, this whole debate about why this is happening and what we need to do to change it. Yeah, well, I mean, when I look at this chart, for instance, uh, this goes to some of the earlier grades. The one I brought up earlier was about college, but, um, you know, on average, uh, figure A here shows on average girls' grades are better. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it shows, you know, uh, in non non STEM in particular, girls far outpacing boys in mm -hmm. STEM. There's kind of on average much better, and then you've got like the extremes for the boys and the girls. Um, what do you think? Actually, you know, you mentioned there, that it's controversial why this is happening. What are your conclusions about what explains these problems in school? Yeah. So um, what when I looked at the research on this, I think there's there's many things going on. But one of the clear things that stands out is that the difference between boys and girls and their school achievement is not down to cognitive skills. It's not intelligence. Mm -hmm. So boys and girls are comparably intelligent. Um, this is a difference in um, attitude and behavior. Really, so it's a difference in like diligence. It's a difference in you know willingness to study. It's a difference in like school readiness, you know, and it's a difference in sort of behavioral, um, you know, uh, behavioral skills, emotional, social, emotional, and behavioral skills in the early years. And so, I think one of the so there's this story that's come mainly from the right, which is this like doubling down on the boys boyness. You know, it's this idea, this like feminization of the classroom. They call it. So it's this idea that. Better. Um, school has become this like feminized space that's like unsuited for boys and what if we want boys to succeed in school we really need to like double down on their boyness and just give them more like content that's about like war mm -hmm. and weapons and you know let them be competitive because that's what they naturally are and let them run around and you know stop doing all this like girly stuff with them and there's something slightly misogynistic in it in the tone you know there's this like feminization is a little bit close to feminism in you know there's something that's like a little suspect in it but what <laughs> we see actually is that um boys are at a real disadvantage in social emotional learning and you see this right from birth you know it's about you know all the things that we talked about previously about that we we don't nurture boys in the same way. We don't talk to them about their emotions in the same way that we don't engage them in these kinds of like social and emotional things. We don't give them role models or scripts or um, stories that allow them to see themselves as like fully emotional, relational beings. So by the time they get to kindergarten, they're already at a disadvantage in those kinds of skills. And some of it, you know, back to the nature nurture thing, probably some of it is nature, but we really compound it with the way that we nurture them. And what we see in the data is that this whole like feminization idea, actually boys respond extremely well to social emotional learning in the classroom. So all of the kind of social emotional programs have been shown to have a greater impact on boys than they do on girls, probably because girls are getting a lot of these kinds of skills and things elsewhere. So actually probably what we need is more feminization of the classroom in the, if feminization means like building strong relationships, challenging masculinity norms that mean that um, it's hard for boys to be seen to be trying. You know, there's this whole thing that like boys have to perform this kind of masculinity in the classroom, which makes it hard for them to like admit to trying or admit to liking school. We've kind of made school and reading and those kinds of things into like feminine coded activities. And so I think actually what boys need in the classroom is more engagement with emotions, with social learning, with um, strong relationships with teachers, more of that kind of stuff rather than less of it. Is there anything about what you would call traditional masculinity that you think is worth uh, salvaging or bolstering? Um, because that, that was one aspect of the book that, I don't know, Chet, I was struggling with a little bit to be mm -hmm. honest because um you were talking yeah. a lot about things like stoicism um yeah. which i think can be a very a good thing it's not necessarily about not having any emotions it's but it's about having kind of an inner strength that doesn't yeah. allow your emotions to control you and like determine Absolutely. your decision making 
yeah um that, that that's you know kind of associated with traditional masculinity um it doesn't mean only men can yeah. can have control of their emotions obviously yeah um what what are your thoughts on masculinity as, as yeah as a framework kind of commonly understand it yeah so i think that this is where it gets really i think this is a really really subtle point and i think that you know i it i find this quite hard to to sort of explain my thinking on this to people but what i believe is so many of the qualities associated with traditional masculinity are positive ones of course you know that so strength courage bravery and mm-hmm. even yes emotional stoicism in the sense of not emotional suppression and emotional detachment but like sometimes of course you know keeping control of your emotions and moving forward anyway and you know it can be extremely important qualities I think where it gets tricky for me so I think that you know there's been these attempts to sort of reframe you know as an answer to this whole like toxic masculinity question people have tried to be like well let's reframe it as positive masculinity, you know, healthy masculinity, and try to sort of redefine it. And that's not my preferred framing. I think that these people are doing good work. And, you know, there are many, you know, and I absolutely think that many of those qualities are really, um, really important and really great ones that, of course, worth preserving. But my problem with the sort of masculinity framing is that I think it ends up reinforcing stereotypes rather than um, challenging them. So, I would rather, you know, partly because if we call these qualities masculine qualities, we are by definition kind of excluding women. You know, it's not really quite enough to say, oh, well, it's not only men who have these masculine qualities, but then in what sense are they masculine qualities if, you know, if anyone can have access to them? But I think that's the minor part of it. For me, but hold you on, know, before you go on there, let yeah. me just ask you about that part yeah. of it, because the reason that it's uh associated with male or female is kind of what we were talking about at the beginning where there are some brain structural differences and things yeah. follow from that on average so wouldn't it logically just follow that there would be quote unquote masculine and feminine traits well not necessarily i mean look i think we all understand like socially we understand what masculinity is and what femininity is you know i think these are things that are very De, you know our understanding of that you know even though it's very hard to pin down to a set of traits and to say you know these mm-hmm. are only embodied by men or these are only embodied by women I think we know you know what's masculine and what's feminine coded but I think when we're talking to boys about it I think we've overemphasized masculinity whether for positive or negative I'd rather we saw these qualities and when we're speaking with boys we see them as just human qualities mm-hmm. because I think we've got trapped in this loop where masculinity for boys you know and this is how i talk about impossible masculinity there's this standard that boys feel that they have to live up to which is you know to be tough to be um to you know to not show weakness you know to to be emotionally bulletproof and you know to be sort of almost superhuman and it's this standard that that boys sort of use as a reference point for their own worth all the time so it's like am i masculine enough and there's this constant feeling of fear of falling short and like masculinity is kind of defined by the opposite. So it's like masculinity means anti-feminism, you know, don't be a woman, you know. And so there's this constant fear for boys. And they talked about this all the time in interviews, this like that they they have to be on guard, that they're always going to slip up, that there's always this, you know, idea that they could be knocked off their perch. And if they acted vulnerable or if they showed human flaws or weaknesses, then they would be kind of knocked down, not masculine enough that it would be humiliating and I think when we start talking about positive you know positive masculinity or healthy masculinity like imagine if there was a group for girls that was trying to bust stereotypes and we called it healthy femininity you know what's healthy femininity you know we want to hear girls come along you can be um, a scientist or a CEO but you can still be feminine and pretty I think we would understand that to have a lot of like oppressive baggage and we would be like no thanks you know let's just allow girls to sort of break stereotypes let's not define everything you know there's no reason why girls have to be feminine at all in order to have worth you know but look oh, ahead no and so I think the same with masculinity I think if we just keep res- you know keep repeating this keep this framing that it's about not just about um 
you know, the future of men or the future of boys, but it's about the future of masculinity. And it's just, mm-hmm. you know, how we define that. We just keep restating this idea that masculinity is the most important quality yeah. as a boy. It is the reference point for worth. And I'd rather just take that language out. It's not that I think there's anything wrong with masculinity. It's not that I think there's anything wrong with those traits. It's just that I think we keep restating it over and over and over. And I think that ends up boxing boys in. What do you say to the women like me who I like to pursue masculinity? There are certain masculine traits that I um, enjoy uh, and try to sort of steer myself toward because I find them to be um, good and lovely. Like, you know, for example, um, I I surf. Okay, frequently when I'm out surfing in the lineup, I'm sorry, there aren't that many girls out there. Um, in a CrossFit CrossFit gym, there aren't that many girls there. Sometimes, you know, every, I'm sure there will be the well, actually people who say I'm a girl CrossFitter. I'm a girl surfer. Okay. Yeah, cool. So am I. My point though, like I'm in these worlds and there aren't like, like physical strength is not valorized to the same degree in lady circles per se. Um, Sure, sure. You know, I noticed these correlations between men I know and women I know. And I like the pursuit of being in some of these dude spaces. And I like the pursuit of stoicism of trying to i am a fairly emotional person and so attempting to um you know (laughs) read marcus aurelius and try to conquer that thing that is within me is something that i enjoy and i I just see this as something that you know when we why is it that if i a cisgendered female have the ability in 2024 to be able to pursue some of these masculine coded things and to enjoy the pursuit of these sorts of masculinity why why exactly is it a problem when no i don't think it's a problem i don't think it's a problem at all i think it's great and this is i think we're actually saying the same thing it's more about the language we use to describe it so imagine if if you but if here's i think here's the thing that i'm i'm trying to get at if if dudes like zach or my husband is very much in this camp like the um idea of like being a good man and what good masculinity good traditional masculinity looks like but not in a way that's necessarily so exclusive but rather in a way that says stoicism uh, and strength uh, are good things worth pursuing uh, yeah. and also being in touch with your emotions is a good thing but like the idea of masculinity like there are some things that correlate that men are a little bit more driven to do I think you would- absolutely no I agree with you I mean I think f- for sure like it would be crazy to pretend that you know in a group of surfers there's going to be equal men and women usually or well, that we don't want to take of- risks to that degree I mean my yeah. god no, why would absolutely I? but the, the thing is like imagine you joined a surfer's you know, it, you, you show up to your surfing group and they called it, you know, masculine skills, <laughs> you know, or men's skills. I feel like that that's actually kind of excluding. And so actually, instead of teaching us to kind of, I think that we should be seeing, it's not about whether these things are good or bad, whether it's good or bad to, to, to be gender normative or not. I think absolutely there are so many ways to be a human and great if you want to pursue traditionally feminine coded skills, great if you want to t- pursue traditionally masculine coded skills but I think well so a couple of things one is that I think it's a very different equation when you're talking about women in this moment trying to pursue masculine coded activities I think we still see that as a promotion essentially Mm -hmm. so we still valorize anything that's associated with masculinity and so you know if a girl wants to be like a boy we see that as like a good thing you know that she's 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 doing better in a way Whereas I think we still see for men to pursue anything coded as feminine is a demotion. It's a humiliation. And that is like how we define masculinity. So I don't think these things are quite equivalent. It's not the same for a girl to like want to be a surfer as it is for a boy to want to be. I I don't know if I totally agree with that. My husband gets so um, many props when he does all of the when he's a highly involved parent who's, you know, baby wearing our son all around. And so there's a certain amount of like when the dad comes yeah, into the feminine true. space, it's like you get endless you get extra applause. Price. Yeah, it's and, true. And, and so there are so many dads like that, at least in progressive areas like where I live. There are so many dads like that doing that constantly these days. I see so many sort of very gender egalitarian parenting arrangements and many dads being not just having a front row seat to the act of raising a small child, but being very deeply invested and, you know, rolling up their sleeves and getting their hands dirty yeah. in a way that a generation ago even was just not a thing. So like, what do you make of that type of thing where like men are welcomed into the parenting space in a lot of places now? Yeah. I mean, I think it is, I, I agree with you and it is, it is very real. And there is this kind of dad privilege that, you know, if, you know, my husband does something, my mom will be like, Oh, what a wonderful dad. And I, you know, I'm like, 
you've seen me do that same thing a million <laughs> times and I had zero pros for it at all. And I think, you know, I think it's, it's a complex thing. I think it's to do with men already having this like social capital. And so they're, they're sort of deigning to do this thing. I think that, you know, my friend, uh, Alyssa Strauss, who has written a great book called When You Care about whether we value caregiving in our culture has written, uh, and she wrote a piece about this recently, which was that I think if you were at a dinner party and there was a man who'd like climbed Everest and then there was a man who'd like, um, you know, written a, a very, uh, an award-winning book. And then there was a man who'd taken, you know, who'd been a stay-at-home dad all that time. I don't think that the stay-at-home dad would have the same kudos amongst those other men. You know, I don't think what he'd done would be truly seen as an achievement in the same way as, you know, I think it's fine if they play at that stuff and they get extra praise and great and they look, you know, they look sexy and the baby carrier and it's all, but it's sort of offset by the social capital that they get from traditional masculinity. I think if they really embrace that, then it is seen as a demotion. Unfortunately, I don't think there are many, very many sexy baby carriers that exist out there, but maybe <laughs> that's exactly market market <laughs> will solve. Um, yeah. I do want to ask you, because you're somebody who's thought very deeply about this. Yeah. Was the American Psychological Association's claim that traditional masculinity could be mentally damaging <laughs> the correct thing for the organization to put out there? Or were they, in a sense, pathologizing masculinity in a way that created backlash and was detrimental? It's a great question. And I, I don't know if I have a very clear answer. I think that what they were sort of working towards was really important and helpful because I think that we hadn't seen masculinity as gendered in the same way so i think we've got very good language and vocabulary to describe um the pressures that women feel from gendered expectations so i think we have a good ways of talking about you know how girls suffer from oppression from um gendered violence from body image pressures from pressures to be feminine and thin and hot and all of those things i think we have a good vocabulary to describe it until very recently we just kind of saw male socialization and male gendered pressures as just like the default. I mean, I remember talking to friends who were having boys, you know, and this was not that long ago. Maybe we're talking like 10 years ago that they'd be like, oh, well, you know, in a way I'm glad I'm having a boy because I don't have to worry about any of that gender stuff, you know, any of those like gendered pressures. <laughs> but actually, of course, all these gendered pressures are acting on boys and men all the time. They're just kind of invisible. So I think what the APA were doing was trying to name that problem and trying to be like, look, some of the pressures that we put boys and men under are invisible and harmful. And I think that the language could have used some tweaking. I think it caused people to push back. I think conceptually, you know, I mean, I spoke Matt Engler Carlson, who was on the, the um, team that um, helped draft those guidelines. And it's a really wonderful psychologist and has some really um, helpful and important things to say about the way that masculine pressures can harm boys. And he's absolutely, I think, would agree with a lot of things you're saying, that a lot of these things are definitely worth preserving and positive as well, but we just have to name these problems. And I think we're working towards that as a culture. We're working towards giving this language, giving this voice. I'm not sure that that was like a perfect job. I think it would have been impossible to do a perfect job. I'm glad they did something. But didn't many yeah. men feel vilified by this? I mean, at least a lot of men that I talked to felt a sense of like, why are they lumping these things that we aspire toward that are difficult to pursue? You know, stoicism and strength and, you know, being the protector. Like, why is it that they're sort of acting like this is a bad thing? It just felt like, uh, I don't know, I think a lot of men felt vilified by it. And maybe that's yeah. a reaction not just to the guidance itself and the language itself, but rather the fact that it came in this cultural moment where people were acting like, you know, every man is terrible. Other, yeah. Every other man and their father is a sexual, you know, abuse. Right? Yeah. Like, and I yeah. think it was a really confusing time to have this conversation because, on the one hand, we're trying to call out like what most people would recognize to be terrible behavior, you know, the, the truly wow. toxic, norm, you know. And so I think that was a really important conversation. And we're also trying to talk about some of the ways in which, um, masculine expectations can be harmful for men and so I think it's a very hard thing to pass out and we're at a very early stage of that discussion I mean what was interesting is like since I've written Boy Mom um, I expected that no man would read this book you know and that was sort of a risk we took you know giving it that title Boy Mom here it is you know this is a book that's designed for moms of boys and actually what I've been really surprised it's only been out in the world for three weeks but 
so many men have read this book and tell me that they feel very seen by it and that they feel very that they are really glad that I'm naming some of these pressures and some of these harms. And I thought I would get a lot more of this kind of pushback, which is like, but these are great things that I love and that I pursue. But actually, a lot of them have, have said to me, look, these are things that have really been a struggle for me, you know, that I've felt constantly like I don't measure up, constantly like I have to perform this this persona, that I have to be all these things and it's exhausting and it's affecting my mental health. And so, you know, that was that I'm surprised that that's the response that I've had mainly. And, you know, but I think there's room for all of these conversations. Absolutely. Well, I would say my response uh, was, you know, I guess speaking as the only man yeah. on this uh, show, which is unusual for for the show, and and another example of Liz venturing into uh, male dominated spaces, yeah. hosting a uh, libertarian themed podcast, bravely venturing into bravely, 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 yeah. bravely yeah. yeah, call me brave um, and you know, uh, I think that um, the <laughs> sort of uh, emotional connection aspect of your book um, is incredibly important for any parent of young boys to absorb and like understand that, you know, the male friendships can have uh, barriers that might be imposed by some of these expectations that you're outlining that um, prevents a uh, kind of the sort of like deep level of connection that female friendships uh, yeah. can more easily achieve. And we yeah. see that that's borne out in the data in terms of, you know, loneliness surveys, males mm -hmm. disproportionately affected by that, the manifestation of that being, you know, much higher. Uh, I mean, the worst manifestation of that being, you know, much higher suicide rates. Yeah. Um, yeah. So these are really troubling things that uh, people should take seriously. The other side which I think is what Liz is getting at is that um, there's the toxic masculinity meme um, that feels as though, um, you know, there's it's it's this it's become a sort of umbrella term that like, anything that falls under the umbrella of traditionally defined masculinity um, is sort of you know, in the case of the APA, literally becoming pathologized. Well, um, and this is not necessarily in, you know, the, the broader culture, but maybe in the elite culture and the media and psychology and so clear. forth. And so that is the part that I think gets uh, men, especially younger men, bristling a little bit. Uh, and, and some of the backlash that we've seen to that has been like the gravitation to these figures like Andrew Tate. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, well, I mean, that's, yeah. yeah, I think that the Andrew Tate phenomenon, so yes, I want to, I want to acknowledge your point that I, I am in no way saying that masculinity is bad or that traits associated yeah. with men are bad. I think that a lot of these traits are absolutely wonderful. And I think there is a danger, as you say, that you're kind of lumping in a bunch of things together. And, you know, as I say in the book, you know, the APA thing kind of ended up being a bit of a conceptual mess because they're sort of lumping in a bunch of things together, which some of which are harmful, some of which aren't, some of which are complex, you know. And um, but I think it's sort of a first draft of like looking at pressures in our society and naming pressures which are harmful for men and get in, in the way of things. Mm -hmm. And we don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater, of course. And so, but I think the thing with Andrew Tate and the likes of, you know, these masculinity influences, I think what we do with young boys is we give them, like, right from the beginning, we give them this idea that masculinity is this reference point for their worth. You know, this is the ultimate standard. And we give them a kind of model of what they should look like. And in many ways, that model is actually getting more and more caricatured and extreme over time. So the sort of, you know, I think that old fashioned model of masculinity, which was like provider, protector, this kind of courtly gentleman is being replaced by this idea of this like action figure, superhero, you know, this like um, superhuman almost. And you see it with these like masculinity influences, you see it with the CGI superheroes, you see it with this like the fitness influences, it's this like muscle man, you know, um, hand-to-hand -hand combat sort of action hero reverie idea which is very cartoonish and I think that we're giving this to young boys as a model um, right from the beginning this sort of superhero thing which is quite unexamined you know in the way that we've spent a lot of time examining like princess culture for girls and we're not uh -huh. saying 
like princess is a bad or it's terrible, but we're saying, you know, look, there are some messages embedded within this culture that are kind of harmful to do with like your value rests in your looks, you know, that you can be rescued by a man, that you don't have your own agency about body image and whatever. So I think we've done a pretty good job of unpacking that. We've done a less good job of unpacking the kind of myth that we feed to boys about who they should be, you know, the superhero mm-hmm. myth. And then by the time they get to Andrew Tate level, you know, they, they're 12, 13 year olds, they're primed to receive this message in a very unexamined way. So they're primed to believe that like there's this alpha male that exists and that, you know, that's how they should me- measure their worth. And then here comes this guy who says, you know, I'm Batman, I live in a bat cave. And he use, uses all those tropes of boyhood and superheroes and, you know, whatever to, to give this like idea of fantasy manhood to boys. And they lap it up because they've already been told that that's, what will give them worth in the world? And so well, let's look at it. Let's look at an, an example of that. I've uh-huh. pulled an Andrew Tate clip. Uh, this was the first Andrew Tate video I've ever seen because he's <laughs> and I, I had to search for it because he's deplatformed from just about everywhere. But this was one of his top videos top on place. Rumble. Okay. Um, it's it's uh, Andrew Tate's Ten Rules for Life uh, or something like that. We've um, uh, we've we link all our sources in the description so okay. people can see the fuller thing. But this is just a clip from that. And I'd like you to tell me what you think about this message specifically is resonating with teen boys. Okay. One of the most terrifying, but also gratifying things of, of life as a man is that we're all born relatively valueless. I don't think women are born that way. A woman, if she's born, especially if she's attractive, has an innate value. People just want her no matter what. But as a man, if you're not an important man, nobody gives a fuck about you and they're never gonna care. So you have to build yourself from the ground up and that's scary for a lot of people, but it's also a massive opportunity. You can decide if you wanna be a famous musician or a nice sensitive poet or a painter or a kickboxing world champion or a businessman. You get to decide on all the different characters in the video game. You can choose who do I want to be and then if you actually try actually try you can become it it's not amazing you can wake up and go you know what I want to be this kind of guy I knew who I wanted to be I wanted to be the dude pulling up in the Lambo three in the morning gets out everyone's like who is this big strong rich dude I want to be that man so I became it I think the only thing you can do that's not to generate is usually be fighting a battle or solving a problem good yeah, growth yeah so you need to either fight a battle or solve a problem to avoid degeneracy which means I'm constantly looking for them Oh, there's so much there. I hadn't seen yeah, that clip actually. Un- well, unpack wow. some of that. Oh, for we us. need a whole episode just on this. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's so much there. So starting with, uh, um, you know, as a woman, you have innate worth, and then he says, especially if you're attractive. So he's already put yeah. across this um, misogynistic yes. message. You that have innate worth as an object. As of, an like, object, as long as, as long as you're attractive, and then this idea that as a man, you don't have innate worth unless you conform to one of these like tropes. So, and, and he even says like in the video game, like life is a video game. And I think this is something that, um, you know, that I talk about in the book that like men's inner world is kind of framed by this like hero complex, you know, this like action hero that we, we've we got to be special. We've got to be, um, we've got to be a hero. And it's like, this is sort of part of the reason why video games are so appealing to men because that idea comes with built in inadequacy you know this idea that you have to be this special um conquering invulnerable hero of some type which we feed to boys in so many different types of stories um you know they're always going to fail as real humans they're always going to fail and so i think that boys are moving further and further towards like replacing real life with video game life because that is the only place that they can kind of fill out those you know that they can live out that hero fantasy and sort of embody it because it doesn't exist in real life so i think that's part of it but you know there's these tropes you can be like what did he say the it was the 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 businessman with the fast car or you can be the, right. what were the other ones the tough like whatever guy or A the musician sensitive. yeah the musician yep. the, you know it's this idea that these aren't real humans with real vulnerabilities and real complexities these are like avatars of things that you think you can be and you have to like achieve these things in order to have innate worth and I think boys are already feeling this kind of inadequacy already feeling this lack of self-esteem already feeling that they need to look to these kinds of tropes of masculinity to have worth and then here's this guy saying I can give you this you know I can provide this for you so it's like it works in a similar way to like how diet culture works I think for women which is like 
we tell you that your worth um, rests on you being thin and beautiful and hot. And then we promise you that we have the answer to how to get there. And so without challenging the premise that your worth rests on that, you know, that we're just saying, well, look, I can sell you this thing. So he's selling and that's how he's making a lot of money or he used to be. Um, and that's how he's he's getting these guys. He's preying on people's insecurities. Yeah, I I think that it's a real shame that someone as sort of cartoonish as as Andrew yeah. Tate has been come this this magnet for young yeah. men, especially the way as we talked about at the beginning that he views male female relationships. I think is just yeah. terrible. But um, you know the the core there that idea that you know you're on the hero's journey or you're yeah. writing your own story. I mean, I have to say that is appealing to me. Maybe that's my man brain, but like, what is wrong with that? Because like what my, my, what I wonder when I hear that is like, what is the alternative? Is it just kind of just like melt into a puddle and, you know, no, let I don't think there's you a, up? I don't, yeah. I don't think those are the two options. So look, again, I want to be clear that there is nothing wrong with the hero's journey. That's a, like incredibly compelling story that, has okay. spoken to humans since humans started telling stories. Yeah, I think, it's almost like innate. Uh, yeah, it, like, I think it is yeah. innate to a certain extent. And that's not just for men, that's for, for everybody. You know, it's, it's yeah. a very, very compelling narrative pattern and there's a reason for that. So there's nothing wrong with that at all, but I think it's the only option that we give to boys in some ways, you know? And so what girls and women get a lot of in stories are these sort of relational stories where it's like you're part of a community, that we work together, that we have to sort of track other people's um, feelings and emotions. And I think they give an alternative to the hero's journey. So I think that women also have a sense of the hero's journey in them. Mm-hmm. You know, that's one piece of it. But they also have a more communitarian relational piece as well in terms of what they're handed as patterns for how to live. And I think both of these things are important. And we need to give boys and men a more expansive way to live because I think that this is is harmful you know you have to be this thing or you have no worth i mean that's uh, that's not a great message and then you see and this is something that i i looked at a lot in the book which is just these feelings of low self-worth in men are huge you know i was speaking to boys and men across the board and they always felt that there was the standard that they were not living up to that they felt inadequate they felt emasculated they felt there was this impossible picture for how they wanted to be and I think women and girls feel that as well about a different set of pressures and it's exhausting and it led to this like terrible feelings of low self-worth and this this shame you know uh, Matt Engler Carlson who's this psychologist that I referenced before he says that like shame ends up being a kind of core emotion for men that there's this idea that there's this this standard that you have to meet and that you're always going to fall short because nobody can meet that standard so it's not that these things are not good to aspire to but like I think we're sort of building shame into the project and at its most extreme you know I interviewed um incels I don't know if your viewers are familiar with I'm sure they are they probably are yeah um anyway probably have some incel viewers Oh, hi, incels. Incel identifying <laughs> viewers. Incel, incel identified. Yeah. Persons okay, of well. incel. <laughs> um, yeah. Anyway, hello, incels. Um, I, I hear your pain. And this is, you know, I think that this gap, you know, for the, what was interesting about the incels as opposed to the rest of the kind of manosphere, which is like holding out this hope that you can be this like alpha male and you just do the right things and take the right protein powder and lift the right weights you know you can be an alpha male I think that incels have just kind of like given up a little bit you know this idea that it's just all predetermined they're never going to get there but this like terrible sense of shame and that shame is where violence lives you know there's all this research on that which is like Mm -hmm. it's not masculinity that makes boys and men violent it is the shame of not feeling masculine enough and you see this, there's all this research on it that um, they call this measure mas- masculine discrepancy stress. So this idea that like boys and men have this vision for what they're supposed to be like as a man and they feel that they fall short. And people who suffer from, men who suffer from masculine discrepancy stress um, are more likely to commit all types of violence. So that's domestic violence, intimate partner violence, sexual violence, assault with a weapon, you know. And so I think, we're building shame into the into the project. Isn't the Andrew Tate worldview a high agency one? I mean, I think Andrew Tate, who isn't really somebody that I like, 
it, and it's probably he's probably the worst example of this genre, right? Uh-huh. But there's a whole bunch of other sort of like stoicism, masculinity, fitness influencers. Like I'm uh-huh. thinking of Saul Bra or Andrew Huberman or Tim Ferriss. Who well, Andrew Huberman's not like the, not the best. <laughs> like, yeah, you know, it depends, on, depends yeah. on how comfortable you are with uh, poly relationships, right? Uh, though yeah. I don't know if the women necessarily were That's into not that. What yeah. they, uh, what they said but, I, but I do think it's worth it's worth saying, like, there's still a massive and loyal following to Andrew Huberman, and mm-hmm. you can still find value yeah. from his podcast and his uh, scientific expertise. But, you know, my point being, okay, so maybe these are on operating uh on different levels of savoriness or unsavoriness, right? Mm-hmm. Like Tim Ferriss is perhaps the least problematic, most sensitive of them. Saul Bra, I don't really know where he ranks. Andrew Huberman, okay, sure, there was the New York Mag uh, feature, like expose on him. Um, and then, you know, Andrew Tate is, I think, most people would regard him as the most odious. But the common thread, I think, between all of these people is it's a high agency worldview that they're Andrew. offering men. <laughs> I find that to be very cool and very freeing. And isn't that a good thing that we're giving men this ability to um, look deep within themselves and figure out what they do and do not want to change and that we're emphasizing this gospel of self-reliance and individuality and the sense of like your fate in this world is not predestined but you get to have control over what type of person you are and who you become. Yeah, so I think this is really interesting. My my last book was um, actually, as I wrote a book called America the Anxious, which was um, in part about this and, you know, about this tension between, you know, it's about the self-help industry and the pursuit of happiness and about this tension between, um, you know, the self-conception as high agency and, you know, individualism and this idea that you can, like, pursue happiness as a kind of quest and you know and the sort of social justice model and the idea of community and you know I think these two things are intention they're always intention for every human and I think of course that it's good to conceive of yourself as a person with agency I think that you know of course and this is an interesting question because I think that the self-help industry has traditionally um targeted women you know it, when I wrote that book it was around 80 percent of self-help was consumed by women and it's this idea that you know we felt that we were to blame for all of life's problems and you know you remember all those books like women who think too much women who worry too much women who love too much and there was very little of the like men who worry too little men who think too little men who you know it's this idea that that women were inherently flawed and we needed to change and I think there is this sort of newer self-help industry targeted at men and I think in principle that's good but I think that the tone of it is not actually very reflective I think Mm -hmm. it's often this like forge forward and be masculine and be this like trope and like has this you know it does have this sort of misogynistic um side to it which um is not you know I think we see as you say more in the Andrew Tate thing I don't think it's really reflective about who you are as a human, the emotional side of life. The, and there are there are exceptions. I've heard some of this kind of content, but I think that this that is a very caricatured view of agency. And also, I don't think there's like a huge correlation between people who boys look watching Andrew Tate videos and boys having a good sense of agency. I think that this, you know. The boys who are consuming this content are the same boys who are playing video games, who have this like very caricatured view of adulthood, of manhood. They're the same ones who are failing to launch. They're not the ones who are taking agency. And, um, you know, so I don't think this is really working as a conception. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, Andrew Tate, I don't know if he is, uh, you know, being very helpful to people that are in that situation. It's more that people who are desperate and like are kind of yeah. looking for someone. Yeah. I wonder if there's a better, you know, role model yeah. out well, there. Tim Ferriss is different. sort of the type Tim of Ferris guy is... that you're describing because I think Tim yep. Ferriss is actually a really interesting case. Are you familiar with him? Not it's... really. So I can't really speak yeah. to that. But um, yeah, so tell me. he's. He's interesting because he's basically he originally sort of rose to prominence from the four hour work week and was sort of <laughs> in the business um, tech self-help space of basically saying, here are ways you can make your workflow more efficient. And uh-huh. especially as an entrepreneur, here are ways you can do this. But then from there, he really ventured into he used all of this freed up time with his four hour work week um, to venture into the self-help space. And he's a really interesting case study because he 
has devoted himself to traditional masculine things like he is pretty jacked and works out an awful lot and has a whole bunch of things about powerlifting and training and uh, how you ought to, you know, cut a bunch of fat and build muscle and how you ought to orient your diet toward this. But he also is somebody who uh, he has a section in one of his self-help books about how to pleasure a woman. Um, the 10 minute orgasm, he turns it. Uh, where he like consults with, I know he's like friends with like Esther Perel and, and all these folks yeah. and like consults with uh, people about, hey, a lot of men don't Relax. know what they're doing. Hey, man, you want a robust self-help book? Here's a chapter that might be relevant to yeah, you. Yeah, well, great. And I mean, has, that sounds wonderful. He has parts on emotional, uh, like emotional health. And that's definitely something like he's been in therapy for a long time. But like Tim Ferriss isn't just like trying to do, as far as I understand it, he isn't just trying to do the shtick of like, I'm a jacked guy, but also I'm so sensitive. It strikes me as like legitimately kind of the high agency uh -huh, yeah. package that a lot of men, not just what women want in men, but kind of what a lot of men want. Maybe I, mean, I just know particularly good dudes and I'm lucky for to, to have those types of influences in, in my life. But it does seem like he's sort of saying, hey, you can learn how to like hunt and forage and how to, you know, right? load a firearm and shoot animals and, you know, keep your muscle mass up and lift heavy weights, but also... You should know how to do other things as well. Yeah, and to me, great. that strikes yeah. me as like, you know, the, he's like the, uh, you know, Andrew Tate's kind of the worst possible example we yeah. can pick out. And I'm sure there are so many awful low agency incels who are listening to Tate. But then I also am sort of like, well, wait a second. I'm not sure that AP, the people writing the APA guidelines or some of the um, folks talking about toxic masculinity in public or in the mainstream media, I'm not sure they're really on board with the Tim Ferriss script either, really. I think that he sort of gets wrongly denigrated and cast aside. Yeah, so I haven't, I am, as I said, I haven't read t Tim Ferriss, so, or uh, um, he, his podcast, right? So I oh, haven't, no. um, I don't know his work, so I can't really speak to that specifically. I think that there's something, I, I agree with you, like agency, it's really important as a human to believe that you have agency and that you have some control. Especially if life. we're critiquing our culture and we're like no, in a moment where we're noticing all the things yes. that are wrong with how it looks at gender. And so it's like, okay, well, some of us don't want to be beholden to cultural change some of us just want to like diagnose the problems and then take action yeah, yeah so i think yeah. it's got to be a, a back and forth between those two things and i think that okay. most people would agree with that that you know we're dealing with a combination of cultural forces and social things that we can't necessarily control and we obviously have a degree of agency what i find troubling in the um modern sort of masculinity message and the influences is that i think there's this idea of like specialness and like as a man you're this hero and that you're unique but a lot of like personal agency and actually affecting change, and I write about this in the book, is really quite boring stuff. You know, it's like doing your laundry or like <laughs> studying for your... Clean up your room. Yeah, clean up your room and studying <laughs> for your social studies test. And I think these men are like much more on board with personal agency where it's like, I'm going to be a jack superhero than they are when it's like, actually, if you want to be a functioning adult, you have to do your laundry. And so I think that it's like, is masculinity like and i have this whole chapter which keeps circling back to this same question which is like is masculinity promoting those skills or is it working against them yeah. and i think maybe both yeah. um uh -huh. you know is this like idea of, and, and i go to this like uh therapy residential therapy center in utah which is um the guy who uh runs it was very much on the side of like masculinity is agency it's adulthood it's standing up it's accountability it's responsibility and he was really promoting this personal agency line and I think that in this chapter I explore and I go back and forth many times and in the book I try not to have a very fixed point of view but to sort of like explore these ideas and come back and circle them and look at them again I think that what has got lost in this idea that you're special and you're a hero on, a, on his journey is this idea that a lot of this is drudge work a, a lot of like what it takes it's not special it's not you know splashy masculine glory and I think we're overemphasizing that with boys and underemphasizing that sort of quiet diligence which we expect from girls and women and actually does promote adulthood competence basically competence yeah. and just like you have to do hard things that are boring and sometimes you know you don't get to be so special you know yeah. I mean, in a sense, I, I really like and appreciate the project to try to almost move beyond masculinity and yeah. femininity and talk more about virtues yeah. that are a little more universal and like how can boys and girls apply them in different ways according to their different situations. Uh, as we start to wrap this up here, I'd like to ask you to just 
offer maybe one or two of those changes that you'd like to see either in your own life or just, um, you know, in the wider culture to move us to that place where this book is sort of pushing towards? Yeah. So I think in, you know, that you're right, it's sort of in the home and in the wider culture, but I think in a way the tone is similar in both. I think in the home, I'd like to be able to move to a point where we see boys as um, complex, vulnerable and emotional beings that we can engage with in that way so that we see their full humanity, that we give them the nurture that they need and that rather than trying to kind of control their behavior, that we look at the sort of emotions um, driving it and that we engage with them as like fully emotional and relational beings. Whatever that looks like to you in your own relationship with your own son, your unique, I, I don't like these like, here's five tips and tricks to like interact with yeah. your son because we're all people, we're all different. I don't know your kids, you know, I don't, you know. So I think within the context of your own relationship to think about those things and how we can promote those skills with boys and men. And I think in the wider culture, I'd like to see just less of a shaming and negative conversation, more listening, more ability to see this not as a zero sum game that if we focus on boys and men's issues, then we're somehow taking away from girls and women. You know, I think this is not a competition. We're all in this system together. We're all navigating it. This stuff is complex. You know, there's lots to learn. And I think if we can just engage generously with men and boys, um, drop the kind of toxic masculinity talk, I think. Um, I think that that phrase was useful in its moment and it's maybe outlived its usefulness and just see if we can have a well-rounded conversation that gives social permission for all all the feelings. That's great. Let me ask you the final question of the show, which (laughs) is, uh, what's the question you think more people should be asking? Well, I think more men and boys, uh, we should be asking of more men and boys um, how they feel. So I think uh we have been listening a lot to male opinions so male opinions in the kind of sexist culture have often have outsized values outsized value but we have done less listening to male feelings so i think Mm. you know i think that's you know i i know i'm talking about men and boys specifically but i think you know that's been the focus of this conversation Mm. it's been the focus of our work so i would like to hear more of us asking men asking each other how they feel more and more women asking men how they feel and really listening to the answer. Well, I feel great about this conversation. (laughs) Ruth Whitman, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Just Asking Questions. These conversations appear on Reason's YouTube channel and the Just Asking Questions podcast feed every Thursday. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and please rate and review the show.